Thanks, everybody, for joining us today for our webinar on facilities GIS for tribal communities. My name is Ann Taylor. I'm the tribal team lead for ESRI. And um, before we actually get started today, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, everybody's been in, put into listen-only mode, so if you've got a question, feel free to type it into the chat window. You can type questions in there throughout the presentation, and we will plan to answer them towards the end of the presentation, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. Um, if there are some questions that we can't answer, we'll follow up with an email uh, that has answers to the questions. And then, as always, we'll be, we will be recording this webinar, and we'll be posting the recording online um, sometime after after the webinar. So check your email for links um, that we'll be sending out to access the recording in about a week, actually. And today we have a guest speaker, and um, we'll have Stu Rich from Penn Bay do the presentation on facilities GIS. Stu is the CTO of Penn Bay Solutions and a seasoned facilities management expert. It's going to touch base on the facility life cycle and how Penn Bay's envisioned solution can support critical pillars of success for facility managers and building engineers. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. And Stu, I will hand things off to you. Thank you, Ann. And for those that were wondering, the lovely voice you were just hearing was that of Ann Taylor, who is the account manager for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And my name is Stu Rich, and I'm the CTO of Penn Bay Solutions. And uh, we are an Esri business partner, a gold Esri business partner that really focuses on the, the business requirements of folks that own large facilities and infrastructure. <clears throat> we focus on facilities because facilities are mission critical. It doesn't matter whether you're running a national lab or a manufacturing organization or a school or a casino or a collection of uh, facilities for your tribal community. Your facilities are probably your largest financial asset. They're probably your second largest operating expense right behind salaries and wages. You have a really interesting and complex set of utilities and infrastructure that you're responsible for. In today's world, it's an unfortunate fact that our facilities are a source of vulnerability. And so uh, we need to be able to understand and plan for and monitor our uh, safety and security uh, concerns. And as human beings, we spend 85% of our time inside buildings. So the, the productive ability of our organizations, no matter what kind, is directly uh, related to how well our facilities are performing. The photograph on the left of this slide here is of the Mohegan uh, facilities in Connecticut. The Mohegan tribes have been a customer of ours for a long time. <clears throat> when we first uh, met Steve Marion, he was a single CAD guy with a vision, and now he has uh, quite a team, and they're managing and uh, monitoring a whole range of different aspects of their facilities portfolio in facilities GIS, and they have a really strong uh, interoperability uh, program there between CAD and BIM and GIS for a range of different workflows, many of which we will uh, discuss today. From the point of view of your total cost of ownership in the facilities life cycle from design to build to operate, what we're going to talk about mostly today and what we focus on mostly is the operations phase. That's where 85% of your total cost of ownership is, uh, which doesn't mean to, that we don't have to uh, uh, deal with design and build uh, phases. We need to consume uh, information from the build phase. We need to contribute information to the design phase. But the, the business problems that we're going to focus on today are really focused in operations. Uh, and again, that's where 85% of your total cost of ownership is. I'm going to stop here for a moment, and uh, we're going to have a polling question. OK, so the polling question 
question today, our first one anyway, is, is your tribe currently using any digital systems to manage your facilities? Um, we'll give you guys a few seconds to answer the question and then we'll move forward. Okay, great. Thanks for those of you that answered and looks like um, pretty even almost around, yes, you have, you are using systems versus no or not yet. So thank you for participating in that. Pretty common too for folks uh, to have either no digital systems or <clears throat> or planning to put some sort of digital response into play soon. Um, as, you, as you probably know, facilities is a pretty interesting and uh, complicated space. There are a lot of different groups across your community that have interests in facilities, and they all have uh, different needs for information. Some of them are managing leases, some of them are managing space or capital projects, safety and security. They're all uh, doing the best they can with the information that they have available to them. Some of them may be using uh, big enterprise information systems, but there's a lot of paper and spreadsheets out there as well. The one thing that all these folks have in common is that they're managing information related to a location in the community, on the facility. So we can use location as the organizing principle to pull all this information together. And so uh, whether it's CAD or BIM files, whether it's sensor information coming from your utilities, whether it's enterprise databases or uh, photos, documents, we can organize all of those related to location, whether that's the location of a building or an asset or a pipe or a manhole, so that you have uh, aggregated content that's easy to find, easy to use, easy to support your day-to-day -day operations. So we do that with uh, some pretty advanced uh, data interoperability tools that are designed to pull information from a variety of different business sources into a uh, uh, an information model, a holistic information model that is designed to organize all this information related to where uh, that exists in your facility's portfolio. So these uh, data interop tools are designed to be uh, run automatically in the background and uh, to really uh, make this problem of data interoperability uh, almost a non-impact on your day-to-day -day operations. We're going to stop here again for another quick poll. Okay. Um, does your tribe use any of the following systems? Work order management, BIM, GIS, or CAD? All right. Well, that's good to see, 96% using GIS, that's awesome. <laughs> Since we're um, on an Esri GIS call, it's, uh, that's encouraging, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for uh, replying. That Hopefully, Stu, that gives you some information. Yeah, that's very that. helpful. Yeah. Now, we, um, a year or so ago, we uh, put out a white paper on the road to return on investment for facilities GIS. And it was a really interesting experience uh, doing all the research for that. But the uh, this road to return on investment always starts with data. <clears throat> and your data, as we've described, might, may come in many different forms. You may have a variety of different CAD files. You may have a variety of different other sources of data. You've got some data in GIS. We have a number of data interoperability tools that pull all of that data into a centralized information model based in the GIS. Everything we're going to be talking about today is GIS-based. It's based on the Esri GIS platform, starts in the geodatabase. So we have these automated tools that pull data from CAD or BIM or spreadsheets or database tables into the geodatabase where we can <clears throat> integrate it with other systems. That might be other scheduling systems, it might be other sensor systems, so that we can publish information out into business-specific uh, web applications 
to provide your users with this information in combination along with reports and analysis and key performance indicators so that they can use their knowledge of your facilities, their knowledge of your organization and policies to make wise decisions about how to really uh, make the most efficient use of the investments that you've made in this uh, facilities portfolio in your community. <clears throat> As I mentioned, this is all based on the Esri uh, platform. So we have these automated uh, data interoperability tools that, again, are based on uh, Esri technology to pull data from so many different <clears throat> sources into the geodatabase, into um, a really ArcGIS enterprise. <clears throat> then we publish that data out into our Envision tools, and I'll show you a number of those in the demo uh, to publish out these uh, different web applications. So we're going to stop here for one last polling question, and then we'll get into uh, why should you care. Okay, last question. What is your tribe's highest priority business challenges? So you can, you can pick more than one. Space management, underground utilities, safety and security, and or asset inventory. Okay. Excellent. A lot of wow, asset really inventory. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of asset inventory. A lot of space and utilities. Space. That's really interesting. Thanks very much. <clears throat> That's really helpful. So as I said uh, a few minutes ago, we wrote this white paper uh, last year, and that's in the resources you'll see at the end of this uh, presentation. <clears throat> and uh, one of the main findings from that white paper was that there really are two big value drivers for facilities GIS. The first is improving access to information, <clears throat> and the second is increasing the value of that information by being able to combine it with information from other sources. So for the first point, think about the CAD floor plans you might have available to you on campus. There's probably a handful of folks that have CAD licenses and know how to use CAD. So there's a handful of folks on your in your community that have access to those the information stored in those CAD. If you could make that information available through web applications that everybody across campus could get at, you'd have a lot more value from the information stored in those CAD files. <laughs> Similarly, if you can combine information from other systems together in an interactive mapping experience, you get a lot more information from uh, information that's already being maintained. So if you look at the center circle here, you'll see a uh, floor plan from a school district, actually, that combines information from CCTV cameras, automated door locks, uh, school scheduling system, an intercom system, and the base floor plans. When you put all of that together, in this case, it's in a safety and security context, you have a lot better information about how to respond to an unfolding incident because you have access to information in combination that's already being maintained uh, in, in the organization without adding to anybody's workload. So those two uh, primary business values tend to manifest themselves in a handful of uh, business cases. One is uh, space management, making sure that you're uh, making the highest and best use of your spaces. Another is for asset location and inspection, safety and security, and constituent engagement, helping folks uh, find the things that they need around uh, your facility inventory and making the best use of their day-to-day -day experience. The money involved can be really significant. The first business case I want to talk to you about is reducing uh, barriers, to en barriers to getting at information. Our research shows that uh, that folks spend an extraordinary amount of their time, eight to 12 hours a week, our research shows, uh, trying to find information around facilities that they think ought to be there, but they don't know exactly where to find it. So they spend a bunch of time searching for it, and then they go ask for somebody else that might be able to point them in the direction. And often they'll actually end up recollecting information that already exists on a shared drive somewhere, but they just can't find it. If we can reduce, if, if we figure uh, for 
for an example here that we've got a hundred people searching for information and they're spending four hours a week lost searching for information we think that's low if we can reduce that search time just by 25 percent that'll save you two hundred sixty thousand dollars a year in saved productivity the second business case is a uh, an office space uh, business case it's a space management business case if you've got a million square feet of office space and that's running you ten dollars a square foot which is a pretty rural figure if we can raise that occupancy rate from 75 to 80 percent you'll save five hundred thousand dollars a year annually um, in uh, your occupancy costs the third business case is about uh, maintenance and operations. If you've got 50 maintenance tradespeople uh, around your community and they're responding to work orders in, in one way or another, if we can increase their productive, their productive time, they call it wrench time in the trades, if we can increase their wrench time from 35 to 40 percent by clustering their work orders together geographically so they're spending less time in the pickup truck going from one place to another, that translates into $390,000, again, annually saved uh, by the application of Facilities GIS. So the, the, the savings can be very real and substantial. Uh, but the question then becomes, well, how do we get started? The, one of the first polling questions uh, we had was, how digitally mature are your organizations? And uh, the general response was, we're just getting started or thinking about getting started, which is fine. Um, we've never yet met a customer with perfect data or perfect processes, uh, but every customer can start to make good progress if they just get started. So we advocate this process we call Crawl, Walk, Run, which is really to start with a, a simple pilot project on one focused business problem. Maybe it's utilities for you, maybe it's safety and security, maybe it's space management, but focus on one pilot project that returns a quick measurable success and then start to build that out uh, into a larger, um, a more enterprise kind of implementation. And uh, so we have uh, with Esri some um, initial operating capability pilots that we can talk to you about um, when the time comes. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to Ann or to myself to talk about those. So uh, enough death by PowerPoint at the moment. Let's actually go look at some working software. Let me just reorganize my desktop just a little bit. And I'm hoping you're going to see that I'm logged into Envision. Now, Envision is a set of web applications that are based on top of the Esri platform. Behind this is an enterprise geodatabase, ArcGIS uh, enterprise uh, server and, and such. And then we're publishing out these web applications. I'm logged in as a uh, as an administrator to this system. So you see that um, I have access to a whole bunch of different applications, these blue boxes up at the top. If I were logged in just as a space person, I would see just space apps. If I were logged in as just a utilities person, I would see utilities apps only. But I'm logged in as an uh, admin, so I see everything that's available. I'll show you some of these apps, we don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll show you some of these in action so you can get a sense of the kinds of things you can do here. Uh, below the uh, applications, I have a set of, uh, we call them home links. Uh, these are, most of them, uh, focused on data quality. These are data quality reports to help you focus on uh, issues that may be creeping into your data. Uh, our Envision Help Center here is a, a searchable website of articles about how to get the most out of your facilities GIS. And then we have two sets of what we call KPI cards, Key Performance Indicator Cards. The top set of KPI cards I've authored for myself as an Envision user. The bottom set of KPI cards, the administrator has 
authored for me uh, for anyone who has access to Envision. So the the <clears throat> idea behind KPI cards is that they represent the things that you care most about related to your facilities. That might be over allocated spaces, it might be buildings with a low fa facilities condition index, it might be uh, extinguishers that need to be inspected in the next 60 days, whatever. Depending on who you are as you're using Envision, you can author these KPI cards to uh, represent the things that you care most about. So when you log into Envision, you come to Envision Home, you'll be reminded of the status of those particular issues. And you can jump right down to the uh, issue uh, from the KPI card. So I'm going to jump now into some of these different apps. I'm going to spend a little bit of time in space management. That was uh, one of the issues that uh, I guess space management and utilities are kind of tied uh, for second place behind asset inventory. We'll look at asset inventory. I'll, I'll use fire extinguishers and as, as an example of assets. We'll look a little bit at uh, underground utilities. And then I'll show you just a little bit about how the system is configured uh, and, and the capabilities you have as an administrator to publish out new apps. Uh, you can publish out as many of these uh, apps with different capabilities, different data in them as you wish as an administrator of Envision. So we'll jump into Space Manager first. Uh, Space Manager is a app developed specifically for space managers, oddly enough. So when I come into Space Manager, I'm presented with a list of buildings. I could look at employees or spaces or sites, uh, but I'm going to look at it, buildings for the moment. You can see I have 36 buildings in this sample data set. Um, I have some uh, high-level summary information about those buildings. I could search for a building if I wanted to, or I can use a filter bar to filter down to a subset of buildings that I'm particularly interested in. So maybe I'm interested in uh, buildings with a capacity of at least 100. Oh, and maybe I want them to be of excellent and good condition. So I've now uh, immediately filtered down my sample data set from 36 to 7 that qualify with this filter. I can create these filters in whatever combination I want. The uh, attributes that are filterable is all configurable uh, by the administrator. So uh, when I get a filter that I think is important to me and I want to come back to again and again, I can save those filters. And uh, I can name that saved filter. And when I have a saved filter, I can then create a KPI card from that filter. So creating a KPI card is as simple as creating a filter you want, saving that, and then publishing out uh, a KPI card from that. Just a few clicks, and you've got a KPI card on your desktop. From this subset of filtered buildings, seven buildings, there's a number of things I could do. This actions button, this uh, blue button with the hamburger in the middle of it, uh, shows me what I can do wherever I am in Envision. I could share this view uh, with uh, you if you had access to Envision. Copy and paste this link into an email. You hit that link and you'll be brought exactly to this screen. You'll have this filter applied. You'll see exactly what I'm seeing here. I could do a bulk update here if these buildings shared a common attribute or set of attributes. I could uh, update those all in one uh, edit operation. I can run reports here. Maybe I want to do a stack plan by spaces by type. So um, this is the stack plan of spaces by type for that set of buildings. There's a couple of dozen reports we ship with the system, but you can easily add new reports or um, tweak the reports that we ship with the system. I could also export this data to Excel. Maybe I have another 
analysis or some sort of report I'm preparing. So if I were to export this set of buildings, I would get all the buildings and floors and spaces and re related people in a big spreadsheet that I could do further analysis on. At the moment, however, I want to, uh, I have some uh, interest in this particular building Q that I want to drill into. So I'm going to dive down to the building level. So here I am at the building level for building Q. You see I've got a photo of the building. I've got several tabs of information about that building. I could edit some of this data if I have the right permissions. Some of this data is rolled up from the space and the floor level. You'll see the building on the right is in an interactive uh, web map, so I can see where I am related to the rest of my community and the rest of the world. I can create links uh, to information that uh, are linked to this building, or I can look at all of the floors related to this building. So here's all of the floors with some summary information about it, and I can drill down into one of these floors. So this floor plan data came from CAD uh, originally, could have come from BIM, but in this case it came from CAD. So all of the features you're seeing in this floor plan are now individual features in the GIS. And because of that, I can now symbolize them differently. Maybe I want to symbolize them uh, based on the, or the department that's assigned to them. Or maybe I want to symbolize them by type or use, or maybe I want to symbolize them by availability, <clears throat> which is to say, uh, where do I have spaces that have, um, uh, let me do that again, where do I have spaces that have the ability to hold more people? So you can see these spaces that are gray with a red outline, <clears throat> those are spaces that uh, have uh, more capacity for people uh, than they currently have assigned. So if I look at this space 105 here, you see again a photo of the space, and you'll see that it has a capacity of two people, but there's only one person assigned. I can assign someone else here. I can search for my friend Albert. There's Albert. <clears throat> now, Albert already has a space assignment. I could give him another space assignment, or I can move him, which is what I want to do here. So I'm going to move Albert to this space 105. And when I do that, <clears throat> the space itself updates, and then all of the metrics up to the floor and the building and the site, and all of my reports are automatically updated with that move information. So it's very easy to classify spaces by type and use, uh, classify spaces by their capacity, assign people to spaces. Maybe I want to assign uh, uh, a different group to uh, a, a different um, organization to a number of these spaces. So maybe I want to take this uh, set of uh, green spaces that are currently uh, assigned to the forestry department and I want to assign them to a different department. So I'll select these uh, spaces all together and I'll do a bulk update and I'll change those from the forestry department. Maybe we're going to give those to the College of Engineering and we'll update that. <clears throat> and in that one edit operation, I've now affected uh, six or eight spaces there. So very easy to, uh, to change the assignment of people to spaces, uh, organizations to spaces. We can uh, subdivide organization assignment to spaces if you need that for uh, complex chargebacks. A lot you can do here related to space management. So I'm going to leave space management for the moment. And we'll go to uh, asset inventory. That was the top, the top pick. I'm going to use an indoor asset inventory uh, example for fire extinguishers here. But the uh, this the pattern that I'm showing you could be as easily applied to um, outdoor manholes or uh, fire hydrants or whatever. So this particular case, I'm going to inventory and inspect fire extinguishers. Uh, again, this is 
an example. The fire extinguishers are an example. It could be AED devices. It could be HVAC equipment, uh, whatever. This, uh, this application, this Explorer app, is uh, an app that is designed to work uh, both uh, in on the desktop as we are here or uh, on a phone. So if I uh, change the form factor to a phone form factor, you'll see that the interface reorganizes itself. So you can easily use this app on the phone as well as um, on a fat browser like we have here today. So I'm gonna go up to the third floor here where I have some sample data. And you'll see I have some sample data about fire extinguishers. I could add a new one here. I have permissions to add uh, fire extinguishers. I could measure the distance between fire extinguishers or the distance that's covered by a particular fire extinguisher. I can uh, query the fire extinguisher itself and see information about that. I can add different attachments to this fire extinguisher. Maybe I want to add a, um, a manual to the fire extinguisher. Maybe I've got uh, other information that is uh, interesting or appropriate to add to the extinguisher itself. The other thing I can do is I can add inspection records. And uh, fire extinguishers are one of those things that I need to revisit every 90 days. So I can visit the fire extinguisher record information about <clears throat> is it visible, has it been tampered with, etc. I can attach information to the uh, to the inspection record as well. Maybe I notice that it's being pulled away from the wall and I want to take a photo to indicate that it's a block wall instead of a sheetrock wall, whatever. So I have the ability here in this app and this is just a, an example template app. You can reconfigure these on yourself uh, as an administrator for as administrator for a variety of different kinds of assets we have uh, we're just rolling out at the moment for the University of Notre Dame and one of the asset classes that they want to inventory is crucifixes across campus so <clears throat> um, I don't know what it is that you care about most but uh, the app template is capable of uh, uh, broad inventory workflows, inspection workflows um, in the field on uh, mobile devices. So that's a great uh, example of field data collection. But uh, as a manager, I have uh, other interests in my extinguisher inventory. So I have a, a uh, companion app, if you will, which is a manager app that is paired up with my uh, Explorer app. So Explorer is for field data collection. Uh, Manager is for analysis in uh, in the office. So again, I have my filter bar here. This should look very much like Space Manager that we were looking at earlier. I can filter filter by model. I can filter by um, next inspection date. I can infil filter by last inspected date. So I can. Maybe I want to get a uh, inspection uh, needs to be inspected in the next uh, 180 days, and uh, oops, I gotta clear my let's clear my filters here. Next inspection in the next uh, 365 days. And you'll see those are the fire extinguishers that need to be inspected in the next year. I can create a KPI card from this if I wish. I can uh, also export this data to Excel. Um, so a lot I can do in the manager app that's paired up with the data collection app. So from uh, asset inventory and inspection point of view, uh, the fire extinguisher app template is a uh, is an example of ways you can do this in in many different business domains. Our customer at the University of Washington, I think, has uh, 48 or 50 of these different kinds of apps configured in their campus. So the next uh, business problem we're going to look at a little bit is um, campus utilities. So unlike a 
a utility company, like you might see the water company or the power company, you have not one utility to manage, but dozens. You've got power, water, sewer, steam, chilled water, uh, maybe compressed air, gas, and uh, network, and you have to manage all of those things, and nothing ruins your day quicker than somebody digging up a utility where they had no business being. So the first business problem that we want to tackle here is let's please not dig anything up today. So this uh, viewer app is, uh, is another explorer configuration. It's designed to be given out to folks in the field so that they don't dig things up. And you can turn on the different layers of utilities information you have available to you. They can, uh, they can click on a particular element and get details about that, understand um, how big it is, how old it is, what its material is, that sort of thing. Um, they can turn on or off systems altogether, so maybe they're particularly focused on chilled water today, so they don't really want to see steam and, um, and uh, storm water, but they're really interested in chilled water. Um, but in this particular app configuration, we have turned off the ability to edit or update information. This is really about keeping backhoes from interrupting uh, your peaceful lunch. <clears throat> and that's all good as far as it goes, but there are folks that are responsible for those individual utilities. <clears throat> and they need to be able to do inspections, um, uh, they need to be able to update the information about that uh, data. So we have a different <clears throat> app. It's another uh, configuration of the Explorer template that is uh, focused on the folks that are actually um, maintaining the data about this particular system. In this case, it's a chilled water system. So in this case, if I uh, highlight a pipe, I can see information about that pipe, but I also have now the ability to edit uh, information about that pipe. Maybe I've replaced a section of it, or um, maybe the, the data, maybe it's not steel, maybe it's PVC or whatever. So I can, in the field, <coughs> edit and update information about that, and I can also look at uh, more qualitative information about this system. So in this case, I've uh, turned on the symbology of uh, uh, assets by replacement priority. The replacement priority would take into account things like age, material type, maybe depth, um, condition, and, uh, and come up with a, a priority for replacement so that when you're thinking about your capital budgeting process, you can start to sum up uh, the amount of six inch cast iron pipe that's over 30 years old uh, to uh, contribute to your capital plan. So this, this app here is really designed to help the folks in the field uh, maintain and update the data about specific systems. In this case, we're looking at chilled water, but there are others for steam and, and other systems as well. <clears throat> As with the uh, extinguisher example, where I had an Explorer template, a field app, paired up with a manager template, an office app for utilities, uh, sorry, for assets, uh, we've also got, in this case, a pair uh, with a utilities manager app. So the utilities manager app is, again, the office analysis kind of app. We've got a filter bar here. You see I've got a chilled water system with several different uh, layers. I've got a steam system with several different layers. I've got a storm water system with several different layers. Each of these I can, I can filter by age. Maybe I want, I'm interested in uh, uh, pipes that are over 30 years old. Maybe that's not old enough, maybe over 50 years old. Uh, maybe I'm looking at uh, uh, pipes of a particular condition, um, and I can then drill down uh, directly into 
one of these uh, different records and get an understanding of where is that pipe located actually and what are the specific attributes of that specific feature. So the, the asset manager, uh, the utilities uh, manager app is designed to be paired with um, a set of field apps where you would collect and maintain data in the field and then manage and, anal and analyze that data with uh, a utilities uh, manager app in the office. So um, we've talked a little bit about space. We've talked a little bit about assets. We've talked a little bit about underground utilities. Um, I'll look real quickly at uh, uh, roofs because I think probably everybody out there has roofs as well. We didn't ask a question about that, but I got an idea that all of your um, all of your buildings have roof have roofs on them, and they are a um, uh, a management issue for sure. So um, <clears throat> as you can see from the photo of this building queue, the building is uh, has different sections. Uh, and so the Roof uh, Explorer app is designed to deal with the fact that roofs have different um, sections to them. Each section of the roof has its own uh, type and age and uh, condition, service life, replacement cost, and you can also uh, record uh, particular um, deficiencies in the roof, whether it's a rip flashing or uh, a puncture in a membrane or uh, a tile or, or whatever coming loose. So you can collect this data in the field. We have one uh, customer actually that is now um, uh, managing information about uh, roof safety and security, tie-off tie points and that sort of thing related to their roofs. And then there's, again, a manager app <clears throat> on, the, on the office side that helps you sum up across the community how many, how many square feet of uh, uh, tile roof or uh, membrane roof do I have that's of poor condition and needs to be replaced in the next X number of years. So lots of different uh, things I've uh, shown you today related to data collection, related to data management. I want to talk to you now just a little bit about uh, how the system is uh, maintained and administered. All of the uh, data in these forms that you've seen has the possibility to have their own lookup tables. So you can, through the web application, maintain the information in your lookup files. The uh, lookup tables can be hierarchical. So um, I can set up uh, hierarchies of uh, lookup tables. In uh, the case of assets, we have an omni-class hierarchy, which is, I think, seven levels deep. You could set up a uniformat for condition assessment for buildings in the same way. So all of your lookup tables are maintainable by you. As an administrator, <clears throat> you have the ability to manage many different aspects of the system, from the base maps that are available to you, to the services that are coming from uh, ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, here's the the reports that come with the system. Uh, to add a new report, you just uh, add uh, a new report file and that's available to configure up into uh, the uh, Envision instances. Here's a list of the instances you see configured in this particular uh, demo instance. We'll look at, uh, well maybe we'll look at Roof Explorer and when we configure that you see I have um, a number of layers uh, for each layer here, I've got some details I can configure about how that layer is um, is searched for, whether it's editable, all that sort of thing. I can add new layers, and when I save out this configuration, uh, the uh, that app will be available to whoever logs in with the right permissions the next time. I can change the system theme uh, colors and uh, logos so that it looks like uh, your tribe's uh, app. I can change all of the 
uh, all of the disclaimers on the landing pages and all that kind of thing. So there's a lot of control that you have here over how your system looks and behaves and the kinds of apps that you can publish out uh, related to uh, your data. So I've been talking uh, pretty much nonstop for a half an hour here. I'm going to I'm going to stop talking for a few minutes and ask whether anyone on the line has uh, questions about the materials that we have uh, provided so far. Yeah, so if anybody's got questions, feel free to type them in the chat window or the questions window. And so here, let's start out with this question. Um, let's say we don't have any data, CAD, GIS, or otherwise. Are there any other ways that we can get started? Uh, yes, there certainly are. <clears throat> um, all of you probably have access to some form of aerial imagery, and from that uh, we can either create just uh, simple points for to represent the buildings. We could uh, digitize uh, building footprints and um, start to add and create data related to your facility. So. Um, <clears throat> So not having any data is not a reason to not get started. We can certainly get started with even just simple imagery data and start developing data from there. Um, there are a number of new technologies available today to uh, to quickly scan the insides of buildings as well. So there are a portable uh, scanning technologies, both photogrammetric and lidar based. So uh, creating new floor plans of existing buildings is something that's uh, becoming very fast, easy, and cost-effective. Excellent. So uh, what? Uh, one question we have is, what is the cost per year? I'm guessing that is in relationship to the Envision uh, toolbars or solution. Sure. So um, there are there are different components to the pricing. You all have uh, site license of, of the Esri technology, so that I think is uh, available to all of you, and correct me if I'm wrong there. That's correct. The, uh, the cost of the Envision capabilities, there's a couple of components to that. There's a, a basic software cost, think of it as your server costs, and that's going to run you about uh, $12,000 to $14,000 a year, depending on some variables. And then uh, there's a per user cost. <clears throat> so for folks that are editing and updating data, folks that are running reports, uh, those uh, users <clears throat> cost uh, $250 a year. Now, Envision Foundation, the kind of the first uh, thing you would lay down comes with five users out of the box. Uh, but if you're going to have more than five users, then those would cost you $250 a year. Those are annual costs. So uh, base annual cost is in the twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year. Uh, more if you have a lot more users. Um, then there's some level of implementation services required, uh, depending on the complexity of your data, whether or not you want to integrate with other systems. The folks at Mohegan, for instance, have integrated uh, with their uh, with a number of different systems, including their maintenance management system. Uh, so that um, adds both value and a little complexity over time. Excellent. Uh, can documents be linked to each facility? Yes, uh, documents or any kind of other data. So it might be documents, it might be photographs, it might be spreadsheets, PDF files, can be linked to any feature in the map. So that might be a building, it might be an app. You saw where I had uh, linked <clears throat> uh, documents and photos to fire extinguishers. So that same pattern can be applied to any feature in the map, whether that's a building or a space or a uh, asset or a pipe or, or whatever it is. We also have links to uh, document management systems if that is appropriate in your case. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see. How about if we have good CAD floor plans 
that we would like to integrate with our real-time data line uh, building management systems and automated access control. Can Envision, the Envision system help? Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, let me break that up into several pieces. So the, the first piece is the CAD data for your floor plans. We have automated uh, interoperability tools that automate the harvest of that CAD data into the GIS, and that is what was used to to build the demo I showed you earlier. We also have the ability to consume uh, data from uh, more real-time sources like CCTV cameras or automated access control or uh, maybe it's building management systems. We're working right now with uh, the National uh, uh, Institutes of Health in Bethesda to integrate uh, with their Siemens system that's monitoring their chilled water. So a lot of different integration capabilities are possible depending on what your business priorities are. Cool. All right. Um, will this integrate with Portal for ArcGIS or Enterprise? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, there, um, yes, is the simple answer. Okay. And, and are your um, different solutions built off of ArcGIS Enterprise or, or Portal for ArcGIS? Uh, our systems are built on ArcGIS Enterprise, yes. Okay. So, um, so you can you can use the the data that is maintained and managed in Envision through other uh, portal specific apps. Um, that's uh, occasionally easier to do for outdoor outdoor kinds of features than indoors, but uh, but it's all based on that same infrastructure. Excellent. All right, looks like we're good on the question front. Hopefully everybody knows that our um, story map challenge is still underway. It closes on April 10th um, at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So please, um, if you haven't already, I encourage you to to put together a story map. I know there's not a lot of time left, but you've got at least 10 days or eight days, I should say. Um, if you want to go and look at our recording that we did on building story maps, that is the link at the top of the slide, the go.esri.com 2019 TSMC webinar. Um, and yes, we encourage you to, to submit story maps. We've got some great prizes. Um, each tribe can submit up to three story maps. Winners will be announced on April 12th. Some of these resources maybe, um, Stu, you can explain? Sure. So um, there are a number of resources that we've uh, published out. <clears throat> we work very closely with the Esri facilities team. Uh, the top uh, the top resource there, the facilities ROI white paper, is the uh, white paper I was talking about in the midst of our uh, in the midst of our presentation here. There are a number of other uh, resources that are made available through uh, the Esri endpoints you see there. Um, this will be available to you for download. The 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 webinar uh, will be available for you to download if you don't have the ability to go out there right now. Um, also, if you have any questions abs after this particular webinar, either Ann or I would be happy to re-engage with you, happy to engage with others on your in your community to help, um, help figure out uh, how you might get started and what kind of value facilities GIS might bring to your community. Excellent. And I want to also um, let everybody know our next webinar will take place on June 18th, and it is called The Underutilization of GIS and How to Cure It. It's a webinar that Adam Carnell from Esri will um, present. Hope you will be able to join us then. And the Esri User Conference in San Diego, um, if you still need a pass, please send me an email. We're handing out... Um, free registrations, probably up through till, gosh, maybe the middle of June um, or until we run out of passes. But 
again, if you've got, if you haven't already gotten a pass, uh, let me know. Just send me an email. Um, let's see. Was there anything else I needed to talk about? I think that's it. So, again, we thank you very much for taking the time out today to learn more about facilities in GIS and if you have questions please feel free to co to call or email myself or Stu and um, enjoy the rest of your day <laughs>